Okay, um, so good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Ramin Golestanian and um, I'm going to uh, give a series of lectures on uh, phoretic active matter. Um, I work at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Dynamics and Self-Organization in Göttingen, um, uh, starting a new department called Department of Living Matter Physics, uh, doing only theory. So. Uh, this is basically going to be home for people like you, uh, so I hope that you will all pass through there um, and enjoy the, uh, the environment there that we will hopefully uh, build uh, uh, with the help of, uh, of, of young people. I've only started recruiting, so uh, so far I've had a few people joining and we are setting up things, so it's a very fresh uh, attempt. Um, I chose to only give uh, lectures on the blackboard, even complicated uh, drawings and so on, I will try to reproduce. Uh, so you will all see how uh, uh, bad my drawing skills are, but I think um, this way things will uh, be at a better pace and we will interact more. So I don't care if I get to where I want to get to, the, the aim will be to go there slowly enough to, to basically follow everything. So any place that you want to ask questions, something is not clear, just raise your hand and stop me and we will ba basically build this uh, together. Okay, so what do I mean by this uh, uh, title? And in particular, I'd like to start with uh, a generic class of, of active matter uh, with this type of behavior. You might have heard the name uh, diffuse euphoresis. Um, this was basically uh, something studied by Teryagin, I believe it was 1947 when his paper was first published. Uh, and the question is as follows. Um, suppose you have a solution uh, with one uh, species. So you basically take a, a, a chemical and dissolve it in, in a solvent uh, in a way that will maintain a concentration gradient like that. So somehow you need to have a, a, a source of that chemical maybe on this side and keep uh, the gradient because gradient is not uh, an equilibrium status. So if you leave it like that, it will decay to a uniform concentration. Now, uh, do you expect because there's a gradient and maybe uh, you might think there's something like an osmotic pressure gradient in the system for the solvent, so let's say in this case is water, to flow um, in this direction, maybe because um, osmotic pressure gradient is somehow pointing um, to the left. So raise your hands if you think in this system there should be a fluid flow uh, for the solvent. No, so that's the correct answer. Um, what about if I add a solid substrate underneath? So I say, uh, you can imagine that I have big colloidal particles, so I'm zooming in onto the uh, surface of that colloid, or this is just a uh, wall of the container that has that uh, concentration gradient. Assuming that there is no interaction between the molecules, the, uh, the, the solute molecules, and the surface. So assuming I have point particles, and basically, so they literally have mathematically uh, vanishing radius, and they will only see the surface when they are on it. I guess the way I'm posing the question, you sort of know the answer. Uh, so the answer is no as well. So there is no uh, flow in that case. Um, However, if I add another complication, not complication, but another ingredient, um, and that is the interaction between these uh, solute molecules and the surface, uh, with some interaction potential, let's call it W, and it will be a function of the distance uh, between the molecule and the surface. So I want to uh, describe basically the phenomenon when there is an interaction like that uh, and 
diffuse euphoresis explains the motion of the solvent when there is such an interaction and uh, the interaction, well, the range of the interaction will control um, the flow of the solvent. How do we work this out? Uh, following the Ryagin, um, basically every solute molecule will experience a force uh, and considering that this solute molecule now is a part of the solution because it's um, attached to the solvent by no slip boundary condition let's say or even it's a slip boundary condition and still moving that molecule will cause externally by some force will cause some sort of flow in the nearby uh, fluid then there will be a body force acting on the fluid which is proportional to the concentration of these uh, molecules and that force. So these are the ingredients that I need to start with. Uh, then I can write two sets of equations. One is um, a continuity equation uh, for the density of these solute molecules. So that will be in this form. Uh, number conservation and then I need to specify so rho again is the density I need to specify the flux density that has a diffusive part um, it has a drift part um, to do with this force uh, basically I can write this as um, velocity which is mobility and I choose to write mobility as V divided by KT beta being the inverse of KT um, times this force uh, times the concentration so this is F um, and this is F in my notation right and then if I call the solvent velocity V there'll be an advection as well So the equation in stationary states uh, will be divergence of J equals zero. So I'll just uh, write that. That will be minus D. I choose to write this term as the divergence of the body force um, and then uh, so this is the mobility and then there is an um, advection term V dot del and then there's also a row times divergence of V and I assume that my solvent is incompressible uh, so in fact I I need to write down next the equation for the for the solvent um, and that will be basically Stokes equation. So I'll have Stokes equation itself uh, and the equation which I already used actually in that. Uh, so this is essentially divergence of a hydrodynamic stress uh, and I need to put in the body force as well on the right hand side. So far clear? Um, yes, so let's, uh, this is a very important point, we need to be clear on who is exerting a force on who because that's basically at the core of my discussion. So uh, what I'm saying here is suppose W is an attractive interaction, so the wall is pulling on this molecule with a force F and the molecule is attached to the solvent, so the solvent is feeling that pulling force. So I don't need to change the sign of that force when I'm writing my Stokes equation. It's the same body force, right? So now you can see um, I can actually take the divergence of this equation as well and get rid of uh, velocity here. Uh, what I 
I find is minus Laplacian of pressure plus divergence of the body force equals zero. Yes. Um, you mean the surface? Okay. This one. Um, that's an entropic force, but we don't, uh, we don't um, need to incorporate an entropic force on the right-hand side of the Stokes equation because anything entropic uh, or of any thermodynamic origin that wants to m make its way in the force balance equation, in Stokes equation, will have to come through... Uh, these terms uh, naturally. So maybe pressure will have some term which, uh, which has that, but we need to derive that. This has to be done from first principle. I cannot just say that I take out, out uh, from my pocket a so-called osmotic pressure term and add it here. That's the main objective of this calculation. I want to derive everything from very clear uh, starting points. And mechanical body force is the only thing that I need, I know at the moment, to put in on the right hand side plus the hydrostatic pressure which I need to calculate. This is something which I need to work out. There is no missing ingredient basically. So do we all ag agree on that? Uh, hopefully. Yes. Yes. Um, Anything that happens through this has to come through this type of uh, description because, I mean, you're describing an interaction or a, or a feedback loop, but that feedback loop to me sounds like you have already solved these equations in your head and you have this picture of the interaction and the back uh, reaction of that flow on the fluid, for example, that comes into the advection and so on. But if you think about the, the terms in the equation, there's nothing really missing here. I mean, let's basically convince ourselves that there's nothing missing in terms of, of terms in the equation. So something you would uh, calculate from first principle, I need to still work this through and, and solve it. But to set up my equation, I'm claiming that there's nothing missing. And I really need every one of you to agree on that before we can make uh, a step further. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you still have time to disagree. Uh, so I have two equations. Uh, actually, this is not an equation. Now it is. So do tell me if I'm, I'm getting things wrong like that. Sorry? Uh, this is steady state divergence of j equals zero. So I took the divergence of j, this is the first one, this is the second one, and the third one had two terms, one of them went away because of that, and it's now equal to zero. Right? Um... I am in the overdamped limit, that is correct. Yes, so this part basically uh, is assuming overdamped limit. So there's no, I mean, I don't have access to the inertial uh, regime using this description. Yes, correct. Uh, it's stationary state. Yes. Okay. Great, great that I have these questions, so carry on asking. Okay, so now look at these two equations. Uh, there's something there which is really mysterious. That's this body force, right? And it's in both places. Uh, if you think about it, it's not a mathematically well-defined function either because when you get very close to the surface, you see all of a sudden, so most of the time you see nothing, and then all of a sudden you see uh, a potential which is, I don't know, one over r to the six. Yes. Uh, 
Um, okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, if I understand you correctly, diffusion constant has a component which comes from friction coefficient or mobility and near a wall friction coefficient changes because it describes hydrodynamic interaction with the surface. I'm ignoring that for the moment uh, and the reason I can get away with that is because whatever space dependence I have because of the friction here, I will have it also there and later you will see that this sort of cancels for the type of phenomenon that I want to study here. But in general, I need to have this kind of uh, space dependent friction coefficient. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, interactions between the, uh, the colloids or the particles uh, are also neglected at this stage, yes. So essentially this description is only correct when the solution is dilute. Okay? Right, so I was basically focusing now on this body force um, and the problem with this function mathematically is it's most of the time zero and when you get very close to the surface if you think about van der Waals interaction or excluded volume effect uh, if you're familiar with the computational models people typically use weeks channel anderson uh, interaction and so on they are all very very um, strong functions of distance in in a very short um, neighborhood of the surface and that means uh, a very singular behavior for f, in particular if you're taking a derivative of it, divergence. So, uh, I don't want to deal with that, that singular behavior mathematically, so the easiest way to get rid of it or uh, get around it is to eliminate divergence of f between these equations and see what I'm left with, right? So I can always do that. Um, if you combine these two uh, equations, basically you get So the way um, I did this was dividing this equation by d times beta uh, and then that gives a kt to rho uh, which make it look like uh, an osmotic pressure term and then basically there's the advection term. Um, okay? Right. Um, so Let's have this uh, for the moment and see what other uh, ingredients we can add to the story. If you think about, now I told you that we can eliminate F uh, because it's singular, but at the end of the day we need to go back and, and face the uh, uh, interaction somehow. And um, I choose to do that in the vicinity of the surface where I know that W will play a, a big role uh, by looking at the flux. So if you if you focus on this expression in the normal direction, so I can now use uh, a coordinate system um, where this is parallel and that's normal to the surface. Um, in the vicinity of that surface, I can basically expect that flux this is particle flux, um, will be almost zero because I have an impenetrable wall and essentially the uh, flux there needs to equilibrate. Also because the fluid cannot go through the wall, uh, independently I have something else that I know uh, which is uh, perpendicular component of the velocity will also be almost zero in that vicinity, not everywhere, right? So then I can write down uh, this expression in the perpendicular component, so that's uh, minus uh, 
this is essentially uh, going to give me a Boltzmann wave. So the notation I'm using is um, in this region, when W is active, I'm calling it the slip layer, and outside, uh, I will basically use this notation out, and then whatever uh, physics is happening in the outer region, I need to do asymptotic matching when I uh, solve the, uh, the problem there. But I can relate now uh, the concentration in the slip layer, uh, and it will be clear why I'm calling this a slip layer soon, um, to what is happening outside when W is basically zero. Now remember that I told you that f is a singular function as we get very close to the surface and by eliminating that essentially um, we have uh, a combination uh, so p minus kt rho uh, which is not behaving in a singular way um, and if I have uh, basically if I want to look at solutions of this equation uh, in that very very small region when let's say I'm talking about three angstroms or so uh, then I can essentially say that the combination of p minus kt uh, is a smooth function in that region, doesn't have that singularity, uh, and that means I can sort of assume, so as solution of Laplace equation, uh, I can basically say that layer by layer um, there should be an equilibration or balance between the combination of what I can call hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure uh, acting on layers of fluid uh, near the surface, despite the fact that there is this singular uh, body force which is acting on the system. So this is an approximation, um, but it's basically based on our intuition that this equation is, is essentially describing layers of stress balance in the fluid and if you take a layer of fluid, let's say um, here and look at the stress that is exerted on it from the top surface and the stress that is exerted on it from the bottom surface and combine the two, uh, basically what you get is that there has to be um, this type of, uh, of, of stress balance layer by layer um, and this so-called osmotic term will um, essentially compensate for the fact that now I'm not using the real body force of the components that are inside uh, by, by using this trick to eliminate it. So this is an approximation at this stage. Later on I'll come back and do this a bit more rigorously, uh, but for now let's just uh, accept this. Yes. No, no, in the perpendicular direction. Um, but, uh, okay, I'm saying this in both directions, but only in the vicinity of the surface. So really I'm looking at a layer which is th three angstroms or so, um, and I'm demanding that basically I find a smooth solution to this equation in that region, and that can only uh, basically be that this function is well behaved, a smooth function. I am ignoring advection because uh, basically advection is, we can show later, this is a high Peclet number effect. So if Peclet number is small, uh, basically Peclet number is the ratio between this term and that term, uh, then this is a valid approximation. So as I said, um, if you're not convinced by this, I will go back and make it rigorous. But at this point, I want to... Uh, quickly get the result, which is the, the end result, and this is the quickest shortcut that I can find. Okay? Uh, right. Um, so what does that mean? It means I can write basically an expression for the pressure inside the slip layer. That's equal to the pressure outside. <coughs> 
Yes. No, I'm not applying it outside. This is the pressure near the surface that I'm calculating. It will be a function. So basically, I'm doing this asymptotic matching, if you want. Um, outside, which is basically, so if the thickness of this layer is three angstroms, outside is five angstroms, not 10 microns, right? It's, it's important to really bear in mind always that W is extremely short range. This is literally two, three angstroms. So no more than that. Okay. Um, right. So now um, this is the result. Um, hopefully you can. I'll, I'll actually make some room. So what I'm um, basically now doing is looking at a uh, matching between the outer solution and the slip layer uh, under, the under the following condition. So it's a very special uh, condition. Uh, I'm thinking about a case where P, extern P external or P out uh, is basically constant. There is no external uh, lateral gradient. Uh, so I will write that. Okay, this is this region. Yet I know that in the outer region there's a gradient on my concentration. This is basically uh, the, the situation we want to study. So we want to study the motion of fluid uh, and solute molecules when there is a gradient which is maintained. Now what about uh, the area in the so-called slip layer in this uh, uh, area of in the vicinity of the wall? Um, I know something about um, the concentration because I know that the uh, concentration is modified due to the interaction. For example, if you uh, assume that the interaction is repulsive very strongly near the surface, so exclude volume effect, which is maintained or, or implemented uh, strictly, that means that on the surface, um, let's say the density is, is even zero or whatever it is, it's modified. Uh, it's modified strongly. If the interaction is attractive, it will be, uh, there will be an accumulation and, and it's very strongly uh, uh, modified and um, typically it will be modified in a uniform way, uh, which is a big difference compared to this case. So essentially, uh, because of what's happening in this region, for example, that could be depletion uh, or any type of modification in the profile because of the surface, so exactly because of W, because of that interaction. Then in this region, I will have, let's say in the extreme case, no gradient at all. Now I told you that P minus KT rho has to be constant across the layers. And I told you that rho has a gradient. So P minus KT rho as a whole has a gradient, which needs to be maintained in the slip layer as well. And that can only mean that there will be a gradient in the hydrostatic pressure. So in the interaction zone, in the so-called slip layer, there will be a 
real gradient of hydrostatic pressure. This is a mechanical driving force which can push the fluid. Where? In the slip layer, not outside, right? So you should imagine that here in this five angstrom thick layer of fluid very close to the surface, you have real pressure-driven flow which is determined by W. So it's not clear whether it will be to the left or to the right. We will need to work that out, okay? So, not okay. Question? Yes, and then... Um, so in this case, um, well, I'm talking about parallel mostly, so let's write it as parallel if you want. Uh, because I'm talking about things happening... Uh, yes, I think this is a better notation. Thank you. You had a question? Uh, am I switching between them? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, okay, let's always use super. Um, they are the same, basically, if I slip. Yeah, thanks. Good. Um, okay. So, the picture is now clear, uh, but we need to do the calculation. Yes. So I must, okay, so my W can be like that, can be like that, or can be like that, right? But it always has that. Uh, so, so if I'm interested in, in this region, then I can actually say rho has to be zero. This is thickness of a molecule, so I'm talking about one angstrom, let's say. It's, it's really very, very short-range physics, but it's always there. Let's say. Okay? Yes? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm basically, I mean, the world here is has a separation of scale. So I'm interested in a few angstrom's uh, thickness uh, in this direction, the perpendicular direction, and in the lateral direction, things are happening much more slowly, so I will allow it to be much bigger. But if, let's say, I'm talking about vicinity of a colloid, which is two microns in diameter, then obviously when it gets to the curvature uh, kind of length scale, then I need to worry about that too. I forgot who the question was by, but so are you happy with the answer? Yes, yes, good. Yes, that's a valid question, and uh, there is a simple answer to that. Uh, so, if you want to um, check whether writing Stokes equation is good enough for a molecular system, the only thing to do is to do a simulation in which you run the fluid as individual particles, and you run your Navier-Stokes, and you compare them. And this has been done, and basically by people who, who know what they're doing, and the, the verdict is that if you have 10 molecules times 10 molecules times 10 molecules, already you are in Navier-Stokes behavior. Um, so I would say I take that as a, uh, as a reassurance. Uh, it could be that if instead of 10 you're doing, let's say, 5, uh, there are some subtle changes, for example, in terms of uh, assuming slip boundary condition or no slip boundary condition on the surface, etc., depending on the type of molecule or the type of solvent you're dealing with, these will be, I would say, second-order effects that you can, you can add to your theory. But uh, as you will see when I get the final result, it's incredibly powerful to be able to use a continuum theory and, and derive something uh, which then you can use and actually compare with experiments and see that it works. Julian. Okay. Um, so, yes. Um, it's been a while since I looked at that paper, so I can get back to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's um, finish this calculation and see why I'm doing all this. We haven't really got there yet. Um, 
Okay, so what do I want to do? Right, so as uh, you correctly pointed out, I'm basically interested in the in what is happening in the parallel direction now because this is basically the direction that I'm imposing the gradient and things should happen. Uh, I go back to my Stokes equation. In the parallel direction, there is no body force because I assume that the body force was due to the interaction between the surface and the the solvent, uh, the, the solute molecules, and that interaction is always perpendicular, unless you have some weird active particles, but let's say we don't have them right now. Um, so this is the equation that I uh, need to solve, and in the uh, region of interest, I have an expression for the pressure, so I can just put that in, uh, and I'm assuming that outside There is no external pressure gradient. If you have external pressure gradient, that's no problem. You just add it to this, and you get uh, uh, basically uh, the, the, the relevant type of uh, uh, pressure-driven flow in addition to your uh, diffusiophoretic flow. So then the equation can be written down for the uh, flow field in the parallel direction. Um, now, I have a Laplacian there, and basically I can make a, uh, an assumption that um, things for the velocity should happen uh, mostly in the perpendicular direction. Let's call this, for the purpose of the calculation here, let's call this also Z direction. Uh, so. This is something like a lubrication approximation? Yes. Um, so we should, we should get all these right. So parallel derivative of rho out is non-zero because I'm calling it rho out when it is non-zero. So this is basically by uh, definition. So a, a, a lot of... I mean, I'm, I'm using this complex notation and a lot of hand-waving argument because the actual calculation is quite complicated and I'm simplifying it here just to get quickly to the concept and to the answer. But I will go back one more time and repeat this from another point of view where we derive the same thing. So you'll see uh, a lot better the, the details, okay? Right, so I have this uh, expression and then uh, essentially uh, on the left-hand side I have... Um, the second derivative with respect to the z direction. I need to solve this uh, together with the boundary condition that on the surface I want to put no slip boundary condition. You can relax that if you want, depending on the fluid. Uh, and I want to implement a no stress boundary condition at z equals infinity. Um, and then I can integrate. Um, and the best way to integrate this is to multiply it by factor of z and implement the boundary condition on the left-hand side. What you will get will be the asymptotic value of velocity at positive infinity. So this is in the uh, outer region, which you can call Vs, that slip velocity, that will be the slip velocity that is experienced, let's say, if you are sitting at infinity, um, from everything that is happening in this uh, neighborhood. So this could be an exercise you can work on if you want. Uh, so exercise number one. It really takes you 20 seconds, but that's fine. Um, so, uh, 
on the left hand side this gives me what I want and on the right hand side it just gives me an expression so I'll write that expression the expression will be slip velocity equals immobility times the gradient and the mobility will be this expression Okay, um, so you can see that this expression uh, has the structure of a second virial of the interaction. Uh, it's basically when the interaction is zero, this is zero. So that's the answer to my second question. When I have point particles that have contact interaction with the surface, uh, zero mathematical radius, there is absolutely no flow, okay? And when there is an interaction range, uh, typically this integral picks up second moment of that. So uh, you can define a length scale, and I uh, decided to call it the Yagin length and floated it in the literature. And some people have picked it up, but not everyone. Um, And if you define it this way, uh, lambda squared could be positive or negative, whether the interaction is predominantly, uh, depending on whether it's predominantly repulsive or attractive. So it could be that the interaction has all kinds of features and you integrate over all of that and then it comes out, let's say, uh, as a negative value out of the integral or positive value, uh, ultimately. So. deliberately sloppy notation so uh, so that I don't need to worry about signs and in this notation mu is kvt over lambda times Ryagin length squared okay yes Mm-hmm. Uh, the part that I used for uh, the region where W is very strongly repulsive is this statement that rho S is zero. But it doesn't have to be. So the point I want to make is a gradient of rho in this region could be a lot smaller than gradient of rho outside because the particles are facing with a very strong interaction with the surface rather than a very weak pro um, external uh, bias that says, for example, they have to have a gradient. They get close to the surface and realize that the interaction with the surface determines equilibration, so determines basically how they should distribute themselves. And that very often means that the gradient if there is any, will be a lot smaller than the gradient outside. And that's the only ingredient that you need to create a flow. Um, no, this is not true because uh, remember that while W is very strong here, I'm multiplying uh, I'm getting the second variable of this expression. So I'm multiplying it by z, which is a very small quantity in that region. So what comes out of this integral mathematically is what you expect from, uh, from the mathematics. So w can be a, a complicated function, and you multiply the features that are further away by a stronger prefactor, so that picks up some stronger uh, uh, components, but if only if that is still 
sufficiently strong with respect to KT. So really, uh, this integral answers your question. You know, just look at it and, and see where it comes from and whether it's positive or negative. Okay? Right. Um, so we have basically a, a key result uh, which in this particular case where we can have a separation of length scale uh, will tell us how we can solve the problem. We can basically say that uh, if we have a gradient in concentration of this uh, 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 solute, uh, let's say in a, in a, in a general uh, system where we have these big uh, colloidal particles and these uh, small solute uh, molecules and somehow having gradients, uh, we can solve Stokes' equation in this region uh, with the boundary condition that on the surface of this colloid everywhere uh, I will have a slip velocity. Um, so that's basically a, a boundary condition, let's say, for the fluid flow, which I will use to solve my Stokes uh, problem. I don't need to couple them if uh, advection is weak enough, so if Peclet number is small, then that means I have a separation between the two uh, parts of the uh, solution. Okay, uh, is everything reasonably clear on these calculations? I want to uh, do something else now. How much time do I have? Okay, okay, good. Yes. Yes. So anything to do with rigor and you know not being super happy with uh, with the picture here, uh, wait for the second derivation. There is a second derivation. Okay. But I'm second derivation doesn't have picture in it. It's just mathematics, right? So picture is here. in the normal direction, very close to the surface, yes. Is it yes, if you have advection, I ignore the advection here. So I'm also assuming that uh, the relevant flow in this case, which is in the normal direction, has to be very small because the surface is impenetrable. Is yes, I mean, that's really... Uh, you don't even need to put numbers because if you if you think about this, the the solvent here, uh, really there is no way that in two angstrom distance it can have a velocity which pushes through, right? Unless it's porous and it's a different kind of system. And that applies both to J and and velocity. Yes. In which equation? This one. Okay. So you're asking me about the solution to this exercise. Uh, we can talk about that. It's you integrate by part, right? Um, and then you impose these two conditions. The only thing that survives is the value of v at z equals positive infinity. Everything else dies. Yes, this is asymptotic matching. So when I'm sitting on the surface, out is infinity. And when I'm at infinity, in inside is not reachable. So, yeah. Okay, good. 
Okay, so before doing the next uh, part, can I ask how many people have seen the exact solution of flow past a sphere, uh, which gives you the Stokes friction? So this is in Lando Lifshitz. You basically write down str stress and pressure and and go into spherical. Okay, perfect, perfect. I, I will use the solution. So if you forgot it or haven't seen it, just go to Lando Lifshitz after the lecture immediately and and read those two pages, one and a half page, basically. Good. So I have the boundary condition. I want to calculate uh, the following quantity. Uh, suppose I have a colloid. So I sort of avoided using colloid um, for the uh, to call the, the particles I was dealing with before. Those are my molecules, so I call them solute molecules, and they are literally molecules and at molecular scale in the systems that I'm looking at. And then I want to put colloidal particles in these solutions. So these are much bigger, nanometers, tens of nanometers, microns, and so on. Uh, so the question now I want to ask is the following. Suppose I put this colloid inside the solution, which has a gradient, and I want to calculate uh, the drift velocity. Let's say if it is in this direction, what is this? velocity uh, if the gradient is in this direction. And in order to solve this, drift velocity, basically I need to do a bit of hydrodynamics and couple it to the boundary condition that I used. So uh, Stokes hydrodynamics, uh, Again, I will have um, incompressible fluid, and then um, I will have the Stokes equation, which is divergence of the hydrodynamic stress uh, is equal to zero, and the hydrodynamic stress in components is essentially the following object. There are other components, but when divergence of V is zero, you don't need those components, right? Okay, um, so to do this calculation, I want to use um, reciprocal theorem of Lorentz. Um, which is basically a very powerful uh, way of implementing uh, solutions to uh, differential equations. Essentially, uh, you will use uh, Green's theorems or various forms of, of uh, 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 Green's theorem uh, in which you calculate integrals of the uh, quantities that you have in the bulk and then you turn them into surface quantities and somehow that gives you a, a very powerful starting point. So. In this particular case, let's suppose we have two solutions to this equation. Uh, one solution uh, is a pair V and sigma, which corresponds to um, force-free and torque-free uh, motion um, with the slip boundary condition. the one that I uh, just derived. So slip velocity equals mu parallel gradient of rho. Okay. Um, the other one is a simpler problem, is the motion uh, due to an external force F hat, uh, which gives you a velocity V hat. This is basically the Stokes problem. And I'm assuming that there is no rotation at this stage. Okay, so this is being pulled or dragged uh, by this force, giving us this velocity. 
and this is essentially force-free and torque-free motion due to um, this slip velocity boundary condition. The reciprocal theorem uh, can be written like that. If I'm implementing the, the surface integrals essentially over the same surface. So I'm assuming that I have a sphere in both cases and the boundary is this surface. Um, so this is S of T. Actually, in this case, there is no time dependence. Uh, or maybe there is if you are in the rel uh, reference frame of the lab where the particle is moving. Um, and typically the structure of these integrals will involve uh, these cross terms. So what do we know about these terms? Um, we know that V hat on the surface is just a constant because we are pulling on this uh, particle um, and that gives us a constant velocity. And we know that V sigma is force free. So then that means um, on the um, so on this side, uh, this is a constant, and then the rest is just the surface integral of the normal stress, which gives me the total force, in this case zero, uh, for the solution without a hat. So this integral on the right-hand side is identically zero. And that means my equation to solve will be the integral um, on the left-hand side uh, equals zero. So that's the equation I want to solve. Um, for that, I need to build some ingredients. So first of all, the slip velocity or the surface velocity um, in that solution is made of two components. One is the translational motion, which will be the global translation. That's the velocity I want to calculate, uh, plus basically a small perturbation. I'll call it V prime here. Uh, that's basically my uh, slip velocity. And if I put this in uh, this expression, um, I will get following expression. So because V a is a constant, the integral over sigma hat gives me F hat, uh, and I, take I keep it on the left-hand side. Then I have the rest, which is the surface uh, slip velocity times um, the stress, and I take it to the right-hand right -hand side. Now, I need to put in something about uh, this solution, and because I know this solution, I know uh, how to calculate an expression for sigma hat. Um, basically for a sphere of radius A, um, I know the following ingredients that the stress tensor uh, normal components will have the following form and the total force will be minus 6 pi eta A times V. This is basically the Stokes friction. Um, so these two ingredients, I can put them on the left and right hand side of this equation. On both sides, I will get V hats. Uh, and then because of the symmetry uh, of the system, essentially I need to project onto the V hat direction and that gives me um, the final 
outcome, which I will uh, I will write it here. So that's a very simple expression. It just tells me that the global translation of this colloid of radius A, uh, the velocity is given by a geometric average, so an integral of the surface slip velocity over the surface, uh, and then I divide it by the total area. And there's a minus sign. Okay? You can do the same calculation uh, with torque and angular velocity and uh, take it and uh, write down. Uh, an equation for the angular velocity with respect to moment of the surface uh, slip. That is a, it's an exercise. I will uh, describe it soon. Um, so then using our expression, this is uh, mu times parallel gradient of rho. Essentially, this is valid for a sphere. Let me just emphasize that. The velocity becomes the parallel gradient uh, on the surface times the mobility. And assuming that the mobility is a constant, and I'll get back to this tomorrow, um, I can take it out. And write the expression for the velocity essentially as an integral over the uh, um, solid angle, uh, again gradient on the surface in the parallel direction. And you can show that this is um, essentially minus mu times gradient of rho outside uh, at infinity, which is essentially the infinity solution uh, or asymptotic behavior of, of uh, gradient of rho when you put a sphere of finite radius inside it. Um, this is exercise number, um, I'll call it three. So exercise two. Uh, do this calculation for the angular velocity. And exercise three is um, how do you go from this to that? So show that one over four pi integral of that gradient So this is, you need to solve uh, for rho uh, and basically incorporate the no flux boundary conditions. So normal flux should be set to zero and you place the sphere in a um, situation where gradient is given outside, let's say a constant, uh, and then asymptotically you know what it is and here you, you use solutions of Laplace equation. You build the uh, solution to rho and then you calculate the lateral gradient in spherical coordinate you integrate it and you end up basically with a simple result, which is just the gradient uh, is the asymptotic limit. So the final result uh, 
which is highlighted here, is basically a simple expression for the drift velocity of the colloid. So it's the same mobility uh, that we calculated um, with the uh, Dirigian length and um, gradient of concentration when you're far away from the surface in this uh, uh, situation. Um, and there's a minus sign. So that means when uh, the interaction is predominantly repulsive and mu is positive, uh, the particle will go away from the uh, source of the chemical. And you can sort of see that because, uh, let's say, if you are in this vicinity, then gradient is essentially in this direction. And you expect the slip velocity to be in that direction, which means the colloid will reverse uh, in the opposite direction. Yes. Yes, that is correct. Advection, meaning the drift, ter the, the advection term in the diffusion equation. Yes, so it's correct for small Peclet numbers. Compared to the diffusion coefficient of the solid divided by the velocity, yeah, by the radius. Sorry. Um, I'm assuming that the fluid velocity is, I mean, this particle forms the boundary for the, for the fluid uh, uh, system that I'm solving for, and I basically incorporate the velocity on the surface um, coupled to the gradient, and then I calculate for the translation. So there is no solvent inside. So this looks quite simple, but in fact, uh, everything that we did today, we had to do to get this result. And Importantly, uh, I highlight this fact that the motion of a colloid in an externally generated gradient of solute of, of, of molecules or chemicals is a force-free motion. So it's not in the same class as a Stokes motion where you drag, uh, let's say, um, a sphere with a, with a constant force. And if Naively, we would say that uh, th there is this gradient in concentration. So let's say KBT times rho is an osmotic pressure. And I calculate the difference in the osmotic pressure between left and right. And I treat that as a real pressure or force. And I multiply that, uh, well, and I balance that against the Stokes friction. So V times um, Stokes velocity, um, V times Stokes friction, uh, the answer of that that calculation, what you get will be wrong. Um, and the easiest way to see it is that this expression doesn't depend on the size of the colloid, whereas by doing the calculation that way, you will get a size dependence, a, a, a linear size dependence. Um, and um, basically, that comes from the fact that this is a higher uh, moment of uh, force balance equation. It basically comes from the integrated effect of all these force dipoles that are acting around this, um, uh, the surface of the sphere. So it has the same tendencies um, of uh, something like a Stokes um, uh, uh, force balance equation, but it has a higher moment of the force distribution acting on the uh, fluid which is in the vicinity and that causes the motion. Okay, so um, I think this is a good place um, to stop. Um, so I have some handwritten notes which I will uh, post. Uh, so Julien will help me post them on the right uh, uh, location. And the handwritten notes also include solutions to these exercises, uh, which is why I will probably post them maybe a day after the lecture. So I'll really give you a day to, to think about these calculations. I think the more you engage yourself with these calculations, the, the better you will basically follow it uh, later on. So I do recommend that. Uh, and as I said, really, we want to understand everything which is done on the board. Uh, it doesn't matter how long we uh, go uh, along the, the material that I have produced. OK? So time is? OK, good. Still, if there are questions, people. Mm-hmm.
Um, yes. Uh, that will be basically, yes. So in order to get that expression, you need to, um, yes. <laughs> That's the easiest way to answer your question. So this is for the concentration profile. So um, it's, it's diffusion equation for the solvent, uh, so uh, solute, uh, right? And I want to relate the lateral gradient yeah, to, to yeah, yeah. Yes, I'll do that. So advection, advection is is uh, is ignored because I'm assuming that. Uh, I don't think I'm 